And now we are on page 192. Odysseus just finished talking with his mom. So went our talk, then other shadows came, ladies in company sent by Persephone, consorts or daughters of illustrious men crowding about the black blood. I, I took thought how best to separate and question them and saw no help for it, but drew once more the long bright edge of broadsword from my hip that none should sip the blood in company, but one by one in order so it fell, that each declared her lineage and name. So he pulls his sword out again because he wants to hear um, each of these beautiful women kind of tell who they are and what their story is. Here was great loveliness of ghosts. I saw before them all that princess of great ladies, Tyro, Salmonius's daughter, as she told me, and queen to Cretheus, a son of Aeolus. She had gone daft for the river and Nippius, most graceful of all running streams, and ranged all day by Anippius's limpid side, whose form the foaming girdler of the islands, the god who makes earth tremble, took and so lay down with her where he went flooding seaward, their bower a purple billow arching around to hide them in a sea veil, God and lady. Now when his pleasure was complete, the God spoke to her softly holding fast her hand. Dear mortal, go and joy. At the turn of seasons, winter to summer, you shall bear me sons. No love making of gods can be in vain. Nurse our sweet children tenderly and rear them. Home with you now and hold your tongue and tell no one your lover's name. Though I am yours, Poseidon, lord of turf that makes earth tremble. He plunged away into the deep sea swell and she grew big with Peleus and Nelly powerful vassals in their time of Zeus. Peleus lived on broad Eolca seaboard, rich in flocks, and Nellius at Pylus. For the sons born by that queen of women to Cretheus, their names were Ison, Pharis, and Amethion, expert charioteer. Next, after her, I saw Antiope, daughter of Asapus. She too could boast a god for lover, having lain with Zeus and borne two sons to him, Amphion and Zethos, who founded Thebes, the upper city, and built the ancient citadel. They shel sheltered no life upon that plain for all their power without a fortress wall. And next I saw Amphitryon's true wife, Alcimene, mother, as all men know, of lionish Hercules, conceived when she lay close in Zeus's arms, and Megare, high-hearted Crayon's daughter, wife of Amphitryon's unwearying son. I saw the mother of Oedipus, Epicasti, whose great unwitting deed it was to marry her own son. Remember we talked about an Oedipus complex? He took that prize from a slain father, Presently, the gods brought all to light that made the famous story. But by their fearsome wills, he kept his throne in dearest Thebes all through his evil days while she descended to the place of death. God of the locked and iron door, steep down from a high rafter, throttled in her noose, she swung, carried away by pain and left him endless agony from a mother's furies. And I saw Chloris, that most lovely lady, whom for her beauty in the olden time Nellius wooed with countless gifts and married. She was the youngest daughter of Amphion, son of Iosus. In those days he held power at Orchomenos over the Minye. At Pylos then, as queen, she bore her children Nestor, Chromius, Periclemenus, and Pero too, who turned the heads of men with her magnificence. A host of princes from nearby lands came courting her, but Nellius would hear of no one, not unless the suitor could drive the steers of giant Iphiclus from Philake, long horns, broad in the brow, so fierce that one man only, a diviner, d diviner offered to round them up. But bitter fate saw him bound hand and foot by savage herdsmen. Then days and month grew full and waned. The year went wheeling round, the seasons came again, before at last the power of Iphiclus, relenting, freed the prisoner who foretold all things to him. So Zeus's will was done. And I saw Leda, wife of Tyndareus, upon whom Tyndareus had sired twins indomitable, Castor, tamer of horses, and 
Polly Dukes, best in the boxing ring. Those two live still, though life-creating earth embraces them, even in the underworld, honored as gods by Zeus. Each day in turn, one comes alive, the other dies. Again, those, those are two, um, two young men who were famous and made into constellations. Then, after Leda, my vision came, the wife of Aeolus, Aeolus, Iphimedia, proud that she once had held the flowing sea and borne him sons, thunderers for a day, the world-renowned Otis and Ephialtis. Never were men on such a scale bred on the plowlands and the grainlands, never so magnificent any after Orion. At nine years old, they towered nine fathoms tall, nine cubits in the shoulders, and they promised furor upon Olympus, heaven broken by battle cries, the day they met the gods in arms. With Osa's mountain peak, they meant to crown Olympus and over Osa Pelion's forest pile for footholds up the sky. As giants grown, they might have done it, but the bright son of Zeus by Leto of the smooth braid shot them down while they were boys unbearded. No dark curls clustered yet from temples to the chin. So you can see there in that short little myth that we're told, um, if anyone rises up against the gods on Mount Olympus, they get killed. Then I saw Phaedra. Procris and Ariadne, daughter of Minos, the grim king. Theseus took her abroad, aboard with him from Crete for the terraced land of ancient Athens, but he had no joy of her. Artemis killed her on the Isle of Dia at a word from Dionysus. Myra then and Clymene and that detested queen, Eriphyle, who betrayed her lord for gold. But how name all the women I beheld their daughters and wives of kings? Oh, the starry night wades long before I close. Here, or aboard ship amid the crew, the hour for sleep has come. Our sailing is the gods' affair and yours. So Odysseus has been rattling off all these uh, different women he saw, tells a little bit about them, not a whole lot. Um, you're not going to need to remember their names, but if you're curious, they do make some interesting reading to find out the myths behind these different women. So he's kind of bagging off. I don't care if I sleep on the ship here um, with the crew. I, I need some sleep. Um, and then about leaving, well, you know, that's up to the gods and up to you. Then he fell silent. Down the shadowy hall, the enchanted banqueters were still. Only the queen with ivory pale arms, Arete, spoke, saying to all the silent men, Phaeacians, how does he stand now in your eyes, this captain? The look and bulk of him, the inward poise. He is my guest, but each one shares that honor. Be in no haste to send him on his way or scant your bounty in his need. Remember how rich by heaven's will your possessions are. So Odysseus has been storytelling all this time. And for us, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, that's right. He told uh, about how he left Troy, the tale with the Cyclops, um, Circe, and all these things that happened, the last Dragonians. And now he's ready to stop. And so she addresses the Phaeacians and says, Oh, wow. Did you have any idea this was Odysseus here in our, in our midst? And how do you feel about him now? And, you know, you better make sure you send him off with some good gifts. Then Echenios, the old soldier, eldest of all Phaeacians, added his word. Friends, here was nothing but our own thoughts spoken that Mark hit square. Our duties to her majesty for what is to be said and done, we wait upon Alcinius's command. At this, the king's voice rang. I so command, as sure as it is I, who, while I live, rule the sea rovers of Phaeacia. Hmm. Who really rules the roost, though? It sounds like Arete does, and he just kind of echoes her. Our friend longs to put out for home, but let him be content to rest here one more day until I see all gifts bestowed, and every man will take thought for his launching and his voyage. I, most of all for I am master here. I think it was Shakespeare who said, methinks he doth protest too much. If somebody has to repeat something about themselves too many times, you wonder why they have to say it. So he again says he's master here. Uh-huh. 